Howdy. This video is on radioact radioactive decays. Radioactive decays are first order nuclear reactions. Some radioactive decays are actually used for radioactive dating. And so for, for example, carbon 14 dating can be used to determine how long ago something died. Potassium 40 and uranium 238 dating can be used to determine how long ago rocks were formed. Hydrogen-3, which is tritium, can be used to determine how long ago water was absorbed by the ground. And so after watching this video, you should be able to understand how radiometric dating works, and that under the proper conditions, it's very accurate. You should be able to calculate the time that it takes for an isotope to go from one concentration to another. You should be able to calculate the concentration after a certain amount of time. And so some nuclear reactions that we could talk about, alpha emission, beta emission, positron emission, electron capture, induced nuclear fission, nuclear fusion. Now, if you remember, in terms of nuclear reactions, to make sure it's balanced, you always have to make sure that the mass numbers are the same products reactants and the charges are the same products reactants. And so that's true for all six of those nuclear reactions. Now, only the top four are actually um, first order processes. So all nuclear de decays are first order processes, but not all nuclear reactions are first order processes. Now, when we talked about kinetics, we developed some equations for first order processes and the equations are exactly the same. And so if you remember for a first order process, the rate is proportionate to the number. And so Often in a nuclear process, we'll talk about the number of isotopes. When we talked about the kinetics, we used concentration. And so using this, we can develop a couple equations. And so the concentration at time t is equal to initial concentration times e to minus kt. And so that t subscript means at time t. The zero subscript means initial. And so use that stop equation to calculate the concentration at time t given the initial concentration and the rate constant. Now this bottom equation, you can solve for t and give you t equals minus one over k natural log concentration time t over initial concentration. And so you can use this equation to calculate how long it takes to get to a certain concentration. Now for first order processes, they're really kind of cool. And you can see them in many different fields, not just chemistry, but you can also see them in say biology. And so for first order processes, they're unique in that after one half-life, you'll have half as much, no matter how much you start, you start with. After two half-lives, you'll have a quarter as much. After three half-lives, you'll have an eighth as much. So after each, so after one half-life, you'll have half as much, no matter what the initial concentration is. Now, if you remember in kinetics chapter, we developed a relationship between the half-life and the rate constant. And we saw that the half-life equals 0.693, which is the negative log of one half over the rate constant. And if you need to go from half-life to rate constant, we see the rate constant is equal to 0.693 divided by the half-life. Now, often in, in radioactive decays, you're given half-lives, now, if you want to use these equations, you actually need the rate constant. And so you have to be able to go from the half-life to the rate constant. And so you need to remember that the rate constant is equal to 0.693 divided by the half-life. It's kind of interesting. There's a huge range in half-lives. And so for instance, uranium-238 has a half-life of 4.5 times 10 to the ninth years. One reason it's very hard to deal with nuclear waste, it's gonna be around for a very long, long time. It's also kind of interesting for the man-made isotopes. Typically they're around for very short time, less than a second. And so this one it has a half-life of 3.3 milliseconds. And so I mentioned that Radiometric dating, you're using a radioactive decay to determine how long something, like in carbon-14, how long ago it died, or in, car, in um, potassium-40, uranium-238, you can actually use that radiometric dating to, to date rocks. How long ago was the rock formed? And so uranium-238 has a half-life of 4.5 times 10 to the ninth years. 
Potassium-40 has a half-life of 1.26 times 10 ninth years, and they can be used to date very old rocks. Now, Uranium-238 goes through a series of eight alpha decays and six beta emissions to get to lead-206. So lead-206 is a stable isotope. And so uranium actually goes through many, many steps before it finally gets to a stable isotope. Now, a geologist can measure the ratio of uranium-238 to lead-206 to actually get an idea of how long ago that rock was formed. Potassium-40 decays by electron capture to form argon-40. Argon now, you should remember argon is a noble gas, and so it's not going to be inside a rock because when the rock is formed, the argon will, will just float away. away. And so the rock is placed under vacuum, crushed, and a mass spectrometer is measured the amount of argon gas that escapes after you crush the rock. And so the argon gas was not there initially. The argon gas was only um, prepared or comes from the potassium. And so by measuring the ratio of the potassium to the argon, you can actually get a date. And so a moon rock collected at the Apollo 16 landing site was composed of mineral common to Earth and it is dated at 4.2 billion years old. Kind of cool. Um, the similarity of ages of meteorites, moon rocks, and the oldest rocks on Earth suggests that the solar system formed together. The current accepted age of the solar system is about 4.5 times 10 to the ninth years. Again, this just comes from the radiometric dating using uranium and using potassium. Now for carbon-14, which is probably the, the most famous type of dating, it's based on the concept that you know nitrogen-14 is in the atmosphere. 80% um, of the atmospheric gas is nitrogen. When it gets hit by a neutron, it can form carbon-14 and a proton. Now, carbon-14 undergoes radioactive decays, but the ratio of, say, carbon-14 to carbon-12, carbon-12 is of stable form, in the atmosphere was fairly constant. And so all living things are taking in carbon, and so all living things should have a carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio that's fairly consistent. Now, when something dies, it stops taking in carbon, and this ratio will change because the carbon-14 is going to decay. And so carbon-14 can decay forming nitrogen-14 plus a beta particle, so it undergoes beta decay. But again, the basis of carbon-14 dating is that for living organisms, the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 is fairly constant. And all living or, because all, all living organisms are taking in, in carbon, that's why the ratio is constant. And you know, carbon fourteen is constantly decaying, even in living organisms. But after an organism dies, it's no longer taking in carbon, and so the ratio of carbon fourteen to carbon twelve will decay. Suppose you've discovered an ancient bone amulet in an archaeological dig, and you want to know its age you can use the rate of decay of carbon-14 to determine the artifact's age. The nucleus of a carbon-14 atom is unstable. At some time, this unstable nucleus will emit a high-energy electron called a beta particle, which has a 1-minus charge. The beta particle causes a neutron to change to a proton, and the carbon-14 atom then decays into a nitrogen-14 atom. The average time for half of a group of carbon-14 atoms to decay is 5,730 years and is called a half-life. Your bone amulet is found to contain only 12.4% of carbon-14. How old is the artifact? The level of 12.4% indicates that three half-lives have passed. Three half-lives times 5,730 years is 17,190 years old. Carbon-14 samples can be accurately dated up to 60,000 years old. And so this gives you the activity. This is the ratio, I think, of decays versus expected decays versus historical age. 
and so and the red ones are the knowns and so you can see that the theoretical curve goes through the knowns quite well and so carbon 14 dating is really quite good and so a question you could see in the very near future is carbon from the Dead Sea Scrolls gave 12.1 disintegrations of carbon-14 per minute per gram of carbon. How old are the manuscripts? Carbon and living materials give 15.3 disintegrations per minute. And for carbon-14, let's take the half-life as 5,730 years. And so the rate of disintegration is proportional to the amount of carbon-14 because the rate of decay is equal to rate constant times the concentration of carbon-14. This is what we mean by a first order process, process. And so, you know, the ratio of the concentration is going to be equal to the ratio of the rates of disintegrations. And so we can use the ratio of the rates of disintegrations to discern, determine the age. Notice that there are fewer disintegrations per minute for the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, because some of the carbon-14 has already decayed. Now, this is one of the equations that we developed for first-order kinetics. And K, remember, is 0.693 divided by half-life. We're given the half-life of 5,730 years. And so we can replace 0.693 divided by half-life for K. And we can solve for T. And so we get T is equal to minus... T half-life over 0.693 times the natural log concentration and time T over initial concentration. And again, I mentioned we can replace NT and not with the rate of the dead sample over the rate of the living sample. And so we had 12.1 disintegrations of carbon-14 per minute per gram for the Dead Sea Scrolls, 15.3 disintegrations for living material. So that gives us that ratio there. And again, this ratio is equal to that ratio because the rate is proportional to the concentration. And so when we plug in the numbers, we get that the Dead Sea Scrolls are 1,940 years old. Actually, what this means is that the material to use the Dead Sea Scrolls died over, you know, 1,940 years ago because it stopped taking in carbon. carbon. It's kind of interesting. Sometimes you'll see a picture of the Shroud of turn with claims that it's the barrel uh, shroud for Jesus Christ. Um, there was carbon-14 dating for the flax, which the linen was made, and it was shown to have that the flax was grown between 1260 and 1390 AD. Some people argue that what was measured was something that was used to repair the shroud, um, but carbon-14 dating can be used to accurately date material. There was actually recent research on Stonehenge, and so the builders left organic material uh, um, around and when they ex excavated it. And so if they carbon-14 date the material left behind by the builders, we get that Stonehenge was actually built in stages, built, you know, 5,000 years ago. Really kind of cool. And so you should understand how radiometric dating works, and it's based on um, radioactive decays, which are all first order processes. You should be able to calculate the time that it takes for an isotope to go, to go from one concentration to another. You should be able to calculate the concentration after a certain time. So basically you should be able to use those equations that we developed for first order kinetics. The radioactive decays undergo first order kinetics, just like first order kinetics that we talked about in the kinetic chemistry chapter. I hope that is helpful.